into our third part or the fourth part of our mini-series talking about our mission statement. Now, I'm sure you all have this memorized by now, but I'm encouraging you to memorize it. It is from Romans chapter 1, verse 5, the second part of that verse. I'm going to take a drink here. We exist to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. And so over these four weeks, we've talked about the big picture that God has for us in this new day day, with a new name, proclaiming an eternal message on our sacred mission. We are, this is what we're doing, to bring about the obedience of faith. This place is to be a greenhouse where faith is sown, faith is grown, and faith is is shown for the rest of the world. Last week, we talked about the why we do what we do. What we do is to bring about the obedience of faith. Why we do it is for the sake of His name, to bring glory to Christ and to bring honor to His name. Because in the name of Jesus, that is where we're saved. There's no other name given among humanity that we must be saved. So we exist to glorify Him. We exist to exalt Him. We exist to bring about obedience to the faith for His name sank. Not in a name of a pastor, not of a name of a location, not of a name of a movement, but in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ for His name sank. So what we do, we bring about the obedience of faith. Why we do it, we do it for His name's sake. Now, where we do it is where we're focusing on today. Among all the nations. The gospel is for us, but it's not about us. And today, as we focus in on among all the nations, I want you to realize that God's plan has always included the nations. Our plan should also include the nations. We are to proclaim to the nations the goodness of the gospel of God so that for all eternity we will praise with the nations in glorifying God and enjoying Him forever. So here is the first point of our focus this morning. Plan for the nations. We can see God's plans for the nations from the beginning of the book of Genesis. When God made a covenant to Abram, whose name was later changed to Abraham, this is what he said. Pay attention to this. Genesis chapter 12, and if you have a Bible, open it up. Hopefully you can see these things on the screen. There should be hopefully a link to these notes if you want to follow along. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, okay? This is God talking to this man, Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, notice movement, and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, there's that word, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Note that. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Notice, Abraham was blessed so that in order to be a blessing, the blessing and the covenant and the calling again was for him, But it wasn't just about him. And notice that the blessing would come through him and his descendants, with the ultimate fulfillment, of course, being Christ. And from them, all the families of the earth, catch that, all the families of the earth. In God's mind, this was always his plan. The nations wasn't an afterthought saying, well, God's going to focus on a guy named Noah. I'm going to focus on a a guy named Abraham. 
And oh wait, I should think about the rest of these fools that are around the world. That's not how God thought. The nations were always a part of his plan from the beginning. And from them, all the families of the earth, all of them, shall be blessed. Now, if you continue going through the Old Testament uh, scripture, you find this kind of language scattered throughout it everywhere. You'll see it in the Psalms, you'll see it in the prophets, you'll see it in the writing, you'll see it in every time. And I want you, when you are reading your Bible, because I trust that you are reading your Bible, that when you see God's plans for the nations, right, maybe you'll have a special color, you can put it in blue, or you can put it in green, or you can put it in red, whatever you do, I want you to take note of how often we'll see God's plan for the nation showing up in the Old Testament, okay? Pay attention to that. Now, in the middle of the Old Testament, I'm going to give us a couple other verses. This is right in the middle, Psalm 67. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to it. There's a wonderful model for prayer for all people, okay? Here it is, smack dab. In the beginning, there is Genesis talking about the nations. In the middle, there's prayers like this. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad Sing for joy. For you, God, judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth shall yield its increase, God. Our God shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Are you seeing what is captured here? Right now there's a popular song and I think it's a beautiful song. It goes like, the Lord bless you and and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious for you. Are you familiar with that song? You know why we want the Lord to bless us? You know why we want the Lord to keep us? Do you know why we want his face to shine upon us? Right? You know why? <laughs> that your way may be known on the earth. Okay? We cannot make these passages, we cannot make that song all about us. Right? The Lord's for us and not against us. We get that, okay? But if God's blessing stops with us, we turn from being a conduit into a cul-de-sac. Right? We are designed to be blessed so that the nations of the earth will know him. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. But that's not the whole passage. Why? That your way may be known on the earth. Your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you. Oh God, let the peoples praise you. I'm afraid that sometimes in our Americanized Christianity, we think that the gospel is for us and all about us. We've replaced God's mission with a me mentality. It's wrong. It's sinful. And it's not the gospel. May God bless you. May he keep you. May his face shine upon you. So that the nations will be glad. That his name will be great among all the earth. That's why we sing these things. Do not forget what it's for. Do not forget his heart for the world. The last book of the Old Testament 
talks about these things as well in Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. It says, from the rising of the sun, which rises in every place on this planet, to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name. He will be worshipped and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Rising of the sun to its setting, his name will be great among the nations in every place. You catch what is going on in the Old Testament from the beginning, from the middle, to the end, this concept of his name being great. People coming to faith, ending in praise, has been impregnated in all over the place. We must plan for the nations because God plans for the nations. And he invites us in his plan. And the nations start in your neighborhood. So plan for the nations. Pray for the nations. Think about the nations. Because God thinks about the nations. God plans for the nations. They are in God's heart. And if we are in His heart, then His heart will be in us. And we need to expand our reach and our efforts. So plan for the nations. A plan for for the nation. Secondly, proclaim to the nations. So I walked you through the Old Testament and I encourage you to underline things there that you see of God's plan for obedience of faith, for the sake of his name among all the nations, and then we'll see the same thing echoed stronger in the New Testament. Now the New Testament opens with these lines. After 400 years of God speaking in his written word, God shows up in a new way. And it says, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate fulfillment of the covenant made to his son David and to the son of Abraham. The New Testament opens saying, I'm talking to you about Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment because he's the son of David, which God made a covenant to him. And because God's covenant with Abraham, which was to be a blessing for the nations. Don't lose that connection as it opens up. God sees these things are in sight for him. And the Gospels continue then to tell the story of God in the flesh. Jesus, the exact representation of his being. Hebrews 1.3. The one full of both grace and and truth. And we read about the life of Jesus, what he taught, what he did, his death, his resurrection. And before he, Jesus, ascended to heaven, Jesus had this conversation with two of his followers along a road to a town called Emmaus. And he taught these two about himself from the Old Testament, the written scripture at that time. Luke chapter 24, 44 records these words. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, Old Testament, and the prophets, Old Testament, and the Psalms, the totality of scripture must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. And may Christ open your mind to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning where they were, in Jerusalem. 
Are you catching what he's saying? Even there, everything in the Old Testament has been fulfilled, will be fulfilled. Understand. And now repentance and forgiveness and new life in Christ is, will be proclaimed in his name to all nations. And then right before he left, he gave us a commission that is great. It's called the Great Commission. And it starts this way. It says, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Jesus, given all authority, now commissioning us and his authority. He says, now, therefore, go and make disciples of all, all nations. Now, we are to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey. This sounds somehow familiar, right? Everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now notice the language here. And this is a familiar passage to most of us who've been in the faith for a long time, right? You haven't memorized it. I want you to examine it. Jesus, having all authority because he is God, says go, which means that there needs to be a movement. Now we can't just think that people will come to us and ask us, tell me about this Christ. Now, the hope is that we would live winsomely so that there would be a question to the hope that we have, right? <laughs> Which tells us we have to be a people of hope, right? To all of us doom and gloomers, hope that found in Christ, we have to go and do what? Make converts? No. It's more than evangelism, which evangelism matters because people need to know the message. It's because go and make disciples. People who are made in the image of their maker. Who are learning and longing and working to be like Christ. Where? All nations. For what? In his name. To do what? To obey everything he's commanded you. Nations, sake of his name, obedience of faith. It is impregnated again here in the commission that is great to us all. See this. This is what we are to be about. Now, Jesus is ascended, but it says before you go to do this stuff, I'm going to send you a helper and empower which will come and empower you. And so the disciples, the early believers gather together. Scripture tells us as you go into the book of Acts, which talks about how these things unfolded, there was 120 people in an upper room. And then the Holy Spirit, the gift of God, came upon them. And this is what is recorded. And I want you to pay attention to what happened here. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Now, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a money, mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. It's for them individually. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. Everyone heard this. And they were bewildered. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. <clears throat> they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these men here speaking Galatians? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native tongue? Parthians and Medes, Malites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, 
Phrygian, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to, to, to Crene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. Why did God do this, right? He could have empowered them all to speak Greek, right? all to speak Hebrew. God was making a point saying, I am individually empowering you and gifting you so that my mighty name will be proclaimed in all the nations. And as an example, you get this language, you get that language, you get this language, you get that language, you get this language. Okay. He did this on purpose to illustrate he had a plan that his words will be in the nation's languages. Pay attention to this. Now, the early disciples had issue with this because they thought that they were the chosen people and it was just for them. Now in one sense it is in the sense that God made his promises first to the Jews. But not only to the Jews, also to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. But they thought it was about them and God had to continue to open the blinders of their heart to understand that the mission for the nations was always there. And so as you read Acts, there's these struggles about this. And we come to an interesting passage in Acts chapter 10. Now God spoke to a man named Cornelius, a non-Jewish people, a Roman soldier. And in a vision told him that he was to go to such and such a place and find a guy named Simon Peter, who lived in a certain house. God did this. He said, Cornelius, Go find this person. So Cornelius sent a couple man, men to find him. Now God not only prepared these men, Cornelius, right, and these Gentiles, but he also prepared the head of the church. His name was Peter. Peter was praying. And while he was praying, waiting for a meal, God gave Peter a vision. And he said, Peter, okay, here is something I want you to partake in. I write down a sheet. There's various animals in there. He says, Peter, take and eat. And Peter's like, nah, I ain't that because that's unclean, okay? Acts chapter 10, verse 14. But Peter, Peter said, by no means, Lord, right? I'm not going to eat any of this. For I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time saying, What God has made clean, do not call common. After this vision, okay, so Peter was thinking about this. What are you talking about? What are you saying to me? He was contemplating this. And then men, right? Look at the timing. From Cornelius showed up. And then Peter goes with them, right? And he goes to these non-Jewish people. He went to Cornelius' house, where Cornelius had gathered his family and his friends. And he spoke the gospel to him. And he records this in Acts chapter 10. This is all in Acts chapter 10. And Peter said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. The Jews had a problem of considering other people, non-Jewish people, people outside of their circle as common or unclean. Their problem is our problem. Often we have the same mentality. If they're not our friends, if they're not the color of our skin, if they don't speak our language, if they participate in other things other than we do, 
They're just common criminals, common drug dealers, common Africans, common Asians. This is a problem. Just as they categorize some people as common and unclean, we do the same thing. Those people who are undereducated, those people who are PhDs, don't like those who are rich. Or I don't want to associate with those who are poor. Those who live on the West side of town. Those who live on the east side of town. Right? You see what we do? Make them common or unclean. Oh yeah, those people. Oh yeah, well those people. Those people who are black. Those people who are white. Or Asian. Or Latin. Those people who think politically different than us. All those Republicans. Liberals. Sometimes we're, we're suspicious of those who are young or we don't want to be around those who are old. Well, they're just the gun-loving people. Well, they're just the gun-hating pick people. Pick a category. We do the same. The truth is that the gospel is for everyone. And if we want to go to the nations, we have to start with our neighbors. Well, they're the drug dealers. I wish they moved. Why do you think you live next to the drug dealers? You move in their direction to bring the gospel to them because the gospel's for them. Well, I wish all those liberals would just shut up and die. Did I just say shut up? I did. I wish those conservatives would just give it up. Common, unclean, uneducated, unsophisticated. The gospel is for them. The gospel is for Republicans. The gospel is for Democrats. The gospel is for Asians. The gospel is for Africans. For the single mom. For the homeschooler. To the diamond jeweler, to the alcohol consumer. The gospel is for them all. And who are we to think that we're better than them? Why do you think you live in Rockford? Or wherever you live? Well, I'm for all nations. I'm asking you first, are you for your neighbor? God is calling us to be a church that encompasses and embraces the nation. In order to do that, we have to embrace our neighbors. This city needs a church that is multi-ethnic. This city needs a church that has PhDs and kindergarten dropouts. The city needs a church that embraces people with disabilities. This city needs a church who embraces the young, who embraces the old, who embraces the single mom, who embraces those who have all family. Those who are educated, those who are uneducated, those who are bigger than us, who are smaller than us, look different than us. This city needs that church, and God is asking it to be that for our neighborhood, and then our nations. And we're doing pretty good so far, but God has more in mind than we are currently seeing. I want to see us send missionaries out. But we can only do what we are. So we need to start in Rockford. You need to start with your neighbor. I can't stand him. He's so pompous. Well, so are you. The gospel is for your enemies. And how dare we think 
We are better than anyone because we are not. Common and unclean. God, may he pull that from our heart where we do not see anyone as common or unclean. So I'm asking you to look in your own heart. The Holy Spirit, be so bold to say that, is asking you to look in your heart. Are you like Peter and saying, well, I'm not going to go with those guys because I don't like them. They play loud music. Right? They're up at night. Ugh. Why do you think you have a relationship with them to bring the gospel to them? You overcome evil with what? More evil? Well done, Christian soldier. Are you overcoming it with good? I don't want you to think about this conceptually. I want you to think about it personally. Where are you at, Christian? Peter concludes in Acts chapter 10. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly understand that God shows no partiality. The gospel is for everyone. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable for him. To him. Starts in our neighborhood, spreads to the nations. We're called to be a church among all the nations. Which means we have to be a church among all the neighborhoods. First, we are going to continue to work on this. And some of you will not physically go to the nations. But all of us are called to go to the neighborhood. God, work in our heart. God, you hear what I'm saying here. Do this miracle in this place. The truth is, Colossians 3 tells us, but there is no Greek, nor Jew, nor uncircumcised, or circumcised, no barbarian, no Scythian, no slave, or free, but Christ is in all and is in all. Christ is all and in all. The foot of the cross, all nations, all people, are invited and are the same. I'm going to jump down to the next point. So we are to plan for the nations. We are to proclaim to the nations. And we are to praise with the nation. This is the end result. The whole Bible ends with the book of Revelation, right? As to what God is doing through history and how it will all end. This is the picture of where we're heading, people. I want you to get it in your mind. You're not going to stop the God train. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, Were there are you to take the scroll and to open the seal? For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. Does it make sense to our logo? And to have them, and to have made them a kingdom and priests of our God, and they shall reign on the earth. If your heart is not for the nations, then you will not enjoy heaven. Because this is what God is doing. And then John says, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voices of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. This is all over eternity. Revelation 7, 9. After this I look and behold a great multitude... That no one can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. You see this vision. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they found their faces 
before the throne and worship God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And we do not have to wait until that time to sing this song and to give this type of praise. Revelation 15, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. God's plan for the world is finalized when there is a multitude of people from every nation and tribe and people and language standing together before the throne. And as the worship team gets ready, I want you to consider this quote that I love from John Piper in a book called Let the Nations Be Glad. Second line says this, Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions. Not the church, not man, because God is ultimate. Not man. When this age is over, and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throat of God, missions will be no more. Missions exist because worship doesn't. People don't know, so we do missions. So not that the church grows bigger, but God is esteemed greater. That's the ultimate goal, that we would know Him and enjoy Him forever. So let the nations be glad. We exist to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. I'm asking God to imprint this on our hearts so we understand why we're here. It's not about your comfort. It's not about your status. It's not about your position. It's what God's mission to the nations and our part in it. And we are to be grateful as servants of the Most High God, of sons and daughters of Him, to be included in this plan. And may we do the most we can during the short span of our life. So stop complaining how things are so difficult for you. Start focusing in on God. What can I do during this season that your name would be great among the nations? If you're having Thanksgiving by yourself, be grateful. Pray, reach, extend. So do I think this logo fits us? I do. (laughs) On a theological level, God binds us to himself. He transforms us and he sends us out. The cross is the point. Also in our church, it's a point of connection to one another. It's a point of connection and relationship. It is theological. It is relational. It's also locational where this Property is a cross point between north and south, between east and west. So I am, (coughs) and I'm asking you to pray that God would do something that is bigger than us. We can't do this, but God can. So we ask him to fill our hearts, to change our hearts. And we're invited into following after him to all nations. So I'm going to conclude this morning. And we're going to sing. 
a couple songs, and I want to encourage you to understand what is being sung and allow God to speak to your heart. Next week, we're going to jump into the Advent season in which we're talking about the pronouncement of this gift that was given. Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. We're going to explore the gift that God gave to each one of us, the ultimate gift of Jesus, which is to all people at all time and all places. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He is the great God. So let us pray together. So God, we are here, and we are there, and we're 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 there. And we're there, and we're there. And God, I recognize, we recognize that there's more that brings us together than what separates us. And God, I pray, which I believe is your prayer, for us here and your church, church everywhere, that we would be a place that brings about the obedience of faith. Help us to submit ourselves to you, the King, <laughs> for the sake of your name, that you would be glorified to every place, to all the nations, starting in our neighborhood and extending to the utmost ends of the earth. God, will you glorify yourself in this place for that end? I'm asking on behalf of this congregation, on behalf of those listening, and God, open our hearts. Forgive us of our pride, our prejudice, thinking that we are better than they. God, that stinks. It's foul. We repent. I ask that we would be people who go, that we would be people who embrace the other because you have, God, and you do, God. We look forward, do we look forward to that day when we're together with a multitude, praising you and worshiping you of all colors and all nations. Help us to hang on to that hope as we process and progress and pray and proclaim your name. Be glorified, we ask. Thank you for this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.